It's One Nation Restorations, and we're restoring another American-made tool with American-made tools. Today, we're bringing back this Industrial Manufacturing Co. Ball Bearing Valve Grinder. The things that need restored on this piece include all the rust on the exposed parts, the year's worth of grease and oil that's built up, the steel blade that's misaligned and is rusted and seized to the extension. The rubber is all dried out, so it's not latching onto valves. The crank is loose, and it needs a fresh coat of paint. This tool is from the 1930s, and it doesn't look like it's ever been opened. Old flat screws always make me nervous, but this one especially. These are packed with grease and oil, which has actually helped keep the rust out. But that's not stopping me from putting all that downward pressure on, which is key to making sure that these don't strip out. I'm also using one of the thickest flatheads that I have in my toolbox just to make sure. Removing the faceplate gives us our first look inside. Checking the plate, this one is in great shape. It's free of dents and any damage or rust on the inside. There's also a strong smell. It's like old crayon wax that's melted in a car. The housing still has the original grease that's packed into the gears. Now I use this opportunity to also check out the gear mechanism to see how it works and check for any binding. The top handle has another flat screw and a 3 8 nut on the inside of the housing. I'd normally wait to remove all this grease, but it's hard to know exactly what to take apart in here. I don't have a diagram for this model. It doesn't take much to remove the old grease. Just be careful not to apply too much pressure because you don't know if there's any seals in there and I don't want to scratch the gear up. It isn't that you're trying to save the old seals, but you need them intact to find perfect replacements. Once the bulk of the grease had been removed, I used some brake parts cleaner and a soft brush to work the rest of the way through. After getting a better look under the grease, I moved over to the crank. This can be removed by bracing the arm and pulling the handle down. If there's any damage on the gear, put a stopper on the large gear and do the same thing to accomplish this. The knob screws straight into the handle without much torque because it's designed to rotate freely. The washer on the back of the housing is the last thing holding the large gear on. You'll need to brace the arm again to stop the gear from moving. I used a specialty pair of vice grips that won't mar up the surface and I didn't even have to close them. The nut holding the arm onto the body was the only part on the entire tool that was really torqued on. For nuts like this, I always use a close end because it's easier to round off two corners than it is six. With the spring out, slide the shaft in the main housing. This will allow you to take the nine ball bearings out and of course they rolled right off the bench as soon as I put them down. Next, I tried pulling the rubber vacuum cup from the plate, but was unsuccessful. Instead, I had to add a little oil and pry it off. The plates held on with a cotter pin, and it was easy to get out, but the plate rusted and slightly expanded into the extension piece, so it took some work to try to pry it out. To remove the shaft, brace the extension piece with a 7 16 inch. And of course, while removing all these pieces, look for anything that needs the threads restored. Check out that Garland Hammer restoration on tips for how to use a thread file to do this. I left a link in the description below. With the tool completely broken down, it's time to bring these parts back to life. I started with the vacuum cup because it's the piece that I'm most worried about. I couldn't find a replacement, so I'm going to do the best that I can with it. First, I boiled it for 10 minutes, don't tell my wife. Then I soaked it in oil overnight. For the majority of these parts, I was able to give them a light scrub and some degreaser because they were so well preserved in that 90-year-old grease. My go-to is brake parts cleaner, but there's plenty of other options out there. For old cars with years of grease in the engine bay, I've always used oven cleaner. I swear by it. For the main housing, I want to finish what I started, slowly picking away at the grease until I could get back to that degreaser. It peels off like candle wax on the side of a glass jar, so all you need is time and patience. To take care of the wobble on the hand crank, I used a cold chisel and a hammer to tap the sleeve back down. Not sure what caused this, but it's pretty chewed up all the way around. And to finish it, I used a punch pin to flatten it into the housing. Before starting the visual upgrades to the exterior of the body, take care of the two sleeves on the outside. If you do it after sandblasting, you're going to leave compound on the body, and that's going to prevent the paint from adhering to the surface. If you do it after painting, you'll undoubtedly have a hard time protecting your finish from the wheel and the heat. Once finished, you'll need to protect the polish sleeves from the sandblasting. This order will save you the extra steps of trying to take the sleeves from the 80 grit abrasive to the polished. I use some tape here, but that won't hold up if you directly hit it with the sandblaster. If you don't have a blast cabinet, a wire wheel will do the trick as well. I exclusively used one until I got this barrel blaster for $300 a couple months ago. And don't forget, doing the paint removal before sandblasting will help prolong the life of your abrasive. It is isn't expensive to buy, but it's expensive to ship. For the two handles, I had to consider a few things. While these handles both probably started out as the same color from the factory, the handle on the crank is now much darker from all the grease and oil. This makes it impossible to get out all the color and stains that are beneath the surface and keep the integrity of the knob. So to combat this, you can either make new handles and keep the original color, or you can use darker stain to try to blend them in. Here at One Nation Restorations, we try to preserve as much of the original piece as possible. So we're going to keep the two 90-year-old handles over preserving the exact color. 
After two coats of honey and four hours to dry, I gave them each two light coats of polyurethane top coat and let them sit for 24 hours to dry. Before evaluating the remaining pieces, I soaked all the metal in evapo rust for four hours. On a budget or for excessively large projects like a front end rebuild on a vintage car, I'll also use apple cider vinegar and in a pinch, regular vinegar. But remember, these solutions are also used to rust things and make them look vintage, so you're gonna have to neutralize them. For the housing, use a sandable primer for light scratches and a filler for pitting. We lucked out this time, so it was straight to the vintage yellow. I applied three light coats to get the desired look and I couldn't be happier with the color. It turns out the extension rod is in by far the worst shape of all the parts. Rust was given a chance to set in and it left deep pitting, especially in the lower end. A soft wheel is great for getting the fibers into the bottom of these pits to help blend it in. For reassembly, I added some general grease to the extension before putting on the nut. Now this nut tightens up against the shaft and prevents it from backing out during use. The end of the shaft that's going into the housing will be getting some Lucas heavy duty lithium grease. It's the same grease that I use on all my car restorations for suspension parts. If you're looking for some, I'll leave my Amazon affiliate link down in the description below. The blade went in, but it didn't go all the way down. So I used a garland hammer to get it where it needed to be. I wasn't sure of the size of the cotter pin that was needed, so I took two different sizes out. Put it in the same way that you would if you were installing it to a castle nut. I used the extended prong to this so that it was easy to set in place. For the bearings, apply a generous amount of grease inside. Once they're back onto the shaft, insert it into the housing, slide the spring on, and apply a generous amount of grease back onto the gear. The small gear has a notch, so be sure to line it up before installing the nut, which could misalign and still tighten. Check the setup for binding before moving ahead and installing the large gear. Apply grease onto the shaft of the large gear and in the bushing of the housing. We all saw how much grease came from the factory, so pump it into the housing itself and make sure that the small gear has a thick coat. Slide the large gear into the body and use the round nut on the back of the housing to secure it. Install the handle on the crank and hold the extension with a wrench to stop the gears from rotating while the handle moves. Once installed, pack the inside like it's the last time it'll be open for another 90 years. The contact points between the two gears is the place you really want to make sure that you hit. Before closing it up, crank the handle a few times and check for any binding. Realign it if you feel anything out of place. The faceplate is actually a little tricky to install because the long screws tend to want to go off to one of the sides rather than straight down. But once you got it secured, it's now time to enjoy that new look. We removed the rust on the exposed parts. We scraped away all the grease and oil buildup. The steel blade is now rust free. It's no longer seized and it's aligned correctly. The crank is no longer loose, and it's earned that much needed fresh new coat of paint. To be fair, the rubber still needs replaced, so I'm looking for that replacement now, but in the meantime, at least it's still functioning. This restoration took 10 hours to complete, and my favorite part was learning about how the gear mechanism worked. It costs around four hours to complete with a few supplies we already had around the shop. Now I'm still working on the shop, so I don't have any cars in here that I'm doing a valve job on, but I wanna set up a mock demonstration for how to use this grinder on an intake valve. Start by applying some lapping compound to the valve. Secure the rubber vacuum cup to the top of the valve and then turn the crank on the Indestro valve grinder, which will automatically turn the valve in a fire starting motion. When the compound breaks down and the sound changes, pick up the valve and it'll turn about a quarter to a half a turn. This will allow the unused compound to flow back into the seating surface and introduce grit to the different areas. Now don't forget to subscribe and smash that bell notification. We restored another American-made tool with American-made tools. See you next time.